Hey, everybody. Uh, I am uh, glad to be with you guys uh, this uh, for some of you Sunday afternoon, some of you Sunday evening. Uh, I've got friends who are staying up late in Iran and Armenia who are watching this. Um, and so it's uh, it's really cool to see what's uh, what we've got uh, up for tonight. And we're going to be talking with uh just a man that has just ugh, been such an impact on my life, such an impact on so many people's lives. Had him, had him here last week, and uh, having him again here this week. And I, I, I tell you, it's I have to restrain myself from wanting to like call him every day, you know, and and try to show some self discipline <laughs> in that area. Just, just want to get everything I can from him and and glean everything that there is from him. So anyway, without further oh, let me before before I do that, let me just uh, highlight a couple of things. Some people were asking me. We talked about last week that book uh, by Winky Pratney, and I found the copy uh, where I got really hit by the Holy Spirit uh, was reading this copy. Uh, this is the very copy I was reading where I talked about, especially the part about Charles Finney. And there were so many great things that were out of that, the Cane Ridge revival, all the revivals, Azusa Street, every, every I mean, it's just a captures that. But uh, if you want to get that book, that's there. And a couple of other things that I was just going to highlight in the teaching, because some people were asking me about this uh, afterwards on the stream, is that I did a teaching called Breaking Darkness. And um, this gets into it, it. A lot of it's focusing on. Bra yeah, that's my face. As you can see, it's so close <laughs> there. But uh, breaking the power of darkness, uh, mainly it, part of it is through this uh, breaking the power of deception, but also uh, breaking demonic power, bringing people freedom uh, through deliverance ministry and how to distinguish two between. Uh, what is demonic attack and and things like that and it's it's a really powerful uh, something just the Lord that put in me and I've learned and it's sort of a collective of all these other things so anyway uh, if you guys want that with that's on our website but I just want to bring that up because several people were asking me to um, about that last week without further ado I don't want to take any more time because I want you to hear from him but here's Mario Morello how are you there? It's good to be with you, Robbie. Oh, so good to be with you. I, I, I just dangerous Christian I have ever met. The Rob, world's most dangerous. <laughs> I'll take coming from you. I'll yeah, take exactly. that gladly. I'll take that with with and great. Knows what I'm saying is true. They know. Uh, I'll take that with great joy. I, I, I love it. And you know, uh, to, you know, speaking of that, you, you were one of the first people that I ever saw where I, I felt like that was a, a compliment, you know, like uh, you were talking about the, the being danger to the kingdom of darkness, being, right. da being dangerous to, uh, to secularism, to uh, this sort of spirit of the age and, and not complying to the culture, uh, but being dangerous to that compromise Christian, right. that compromised Christianity. Right. Uh, that just, you know, I, I never thought about that. I, you know, I f feel like my whole life, uh, you know, I was kind of taught to play nice and yeah. I read Mario Murillo and I'm like, okay, oh. <laughs> this, this is it. This is yeah. it. And, uh, that it wasn't about the, uh, you know, it wasn't about playing nice. It was about being relevant in the kingdom and looking for God, what was relevant to God, not what was relevant to uh, just what people were saying and sort of the, uh, you know, the mainstream. But anyway, I, I just, I so I thank you for that. Uh, you gave, my sense was you gave me permission to be the person God created me to be. Well, that, uh, that is a thrill and an honor to hear. You know, I uh, was radical when radical wasn't cool. That's true. <laughs> I'd like to say that. But uh, I really believe that wh when I went on the university campus, it scared me to death to witness to campus radicals. In Berkeley? Oh, it Berkeley. Was, yeah. yeah. Because on every level, they were, they were something else. I mean, this is the 1%. Uh, tile of all uh, high school graduates end up at Berkeley. Yeah, they they not only rebuke you, they had the vocabulary to rebuke you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I would go on the streets and pray in tongues until the Lord would reveal to me 
things about an individual and I'd walk up to them and speak the things the Lord would give me. And, and that was how the ice would break to lead wow. them to Christ. Come on. That, that was before anybody was talking about this, but the power of the word of knowledge right there. Wow. And uh, so I didn't really see the gifts of the spirit in the churches until after years of seeing them on the streets. Wow. Come on. And, and that was uh, that was a remarkable thing. And I give God the glory for it. You know, I, 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 there's so much I want to get into tonight, but uh, that I remember uh, I, I was I, I don't think I've told you this yet, but I was invited to Princeton University to do a wow. lecture on do signs and wonders and healing still happen today. And uh, one of the students that was in the anthropology department was strongly advocating for me to be able to come and to uh, talk about this. And, and he said, you know, he told me, he goes, but if you do it, you can you only do it unless you can give us a demonstration of it. Well, <laughs> yeah, like, absolutely. And he's like, a lot of people aren't saying they can guarantee that. But, you know, you're like saying you can guarantee it. I said, you guarantee it because I said, if there's any place I know God wants to show up, it's at Princeton University. He does. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. that takes courage. That takes boldness from the Holy Spirit to do that. And, you know, it, and it's been interesting because there's so many times people – and a lot of people, what what I find with atheists, I mean, it's surely you, you you would find this the same, but you know, they do have a god they worship. It's their own intellect, right? They you worship know, how they think. Yes. Uh, well, G.K. Chesterton said an atheist is an individual that crawled into a box, painted the inside of that cardboard box black, and then put stars in it and said, "This is the whole universe." <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. You know, you have to do that to be a true atheist. Most yeah, so true. they're agnostics studying. And I, I had an idea for atheist dial a prayer where you call a phone and it just rings. Nobody ever answers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the feelings that I have is that we live in a time where a lot of Christians are questioning the validity of their faith. Yeah, because of on. all the preaching they've been hearing in the last 10 years. I want to give you a vivid example of something. In uh, 2000, in 2016, uh, well, I forget what year it was. I'm going to say uh, it was when David Wilkerson stood in the pulpit and preached on Isaiah 25 at Times Square Church on a Sunday morning. And he said New York City was going to change in one day overnight the city of New York would change. Now, he had not just preached that once. He had preached it several times. Now, what I want to say to the audience is this. Imagine being a member of that church, and the pastor is not talking about prosperity. He is not talking about uh, relationships. He is standing in the pulpit with a cry in his voice like no preacher ever had. And saying, God has revealed to me what's coming to America, how Wall Street will be shut down overnight, wow. how streets of New York will be empty. And, and so now picture Sunday after Sunday, that's your pastor. Mm. The average person, Robbie, would say, that's a terrible church to go to. You're going to leave every Sunday depressed. But now ask yourself, who of all the Christians in New York is best equipped to handle what's going on right now, except the people of Times Square Church, who their pastor deliberately and faithfully equipped them for what is happening right now. And what a rebuke to modern pastors who have prepared their congregation for things that are never going to happen and have left them unprotected for the one thing they need to do. You know, the Holy Spirit told me, Robbie, that these days that we're all stuck at home are the greatest days of our life, mm. not in terms of happiness or goodness. In the next five days, we're gonna see death on a scale we have not seen since the Second World War. America is in a state that is very difficult to describe emotionally because this is uncharted water for everyone. So true. Come on. Those that have sat under the preaching that warned them to prepare, 
and warn them to anchor their soul in Christ. What a powerful moment we're in right now. But if I get a chance, I'd like to comment on why these days at home are so crucial to everyone. Please do. That's why you're here. Please say it. I truly believe, Robbie, that we're going to say these are the most important days of our life. Yes. 30 years from now, if you're still here, 40 years from now, you're going to say, when I was stuck at home, I had an opportunity. And I'm going to explain how that works real fast. One day, the devil put Paul in prison, hoping to shut down Christianity. So now Paul is quarantined. Now, the first thing that happened when he got in there is condemnation, lies, and fear tried to grip him. It didn't work because he was Paul the apostle. But here's what Satan said. You can't do your work now. You're done. You're finished. You're, you're, you're trapped. And, and the fact was that in Philippi, did you know that seven false teachers rose up immediately after Paul was arrested at Philippi and tried to cut up the church like a pie? And Paul was tortured. And finally, the Lord gave him a revelation. He said to the Philippian church, you know, I'm not with you. I can't stay with you. I can't teach you. I can't rebuke these people that are trying to divide you. But he said, he that began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. So when the devil put Paul in prison, he stopped him from preaching, but started him in the most dangerous activity of his whole life. He began writing letters. Letters that would impact billions. Letters that you who are watching have read. Letters that have kept you strong. That wow. exposed the devil. And Satan realized that incarcerating Paul the Apostle was the second worst mistake of his career. The first being crucifying Christ. So that's what I feel. Wow. Every time we're alone, God is sifting what's important and what's not important. Yes, and we have got to make it clear in our mind. And I even I kind of made a list, but I'm not going to go through it. We'll just talk as the Lord leads. But in your mind right now, you need to focus on this. Your church can never be the same. Yes. You can't long to go back to what you had before because God doesn't want you to get good at something you're not supposed to be doing. Come on. In the silence and the sequestering of your house. God is revealing to you the things that matter, the changes that matter. Wow. And if Paul could write the New Testament while in jail, when we're in our homes, God can give birth to visions and new creative things that never occur to us. That's not to take away from how horrible this moment is. It's just a plus side to it, to well, not let the enemy rob us. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, don't be sorry. Don't ever be sorry when you're talking about here. Um, you know, that's the thing is that uh, they're, they're, you know, the, 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 how crucial, you know, uh, that, that this is that, you know, when we were all of us, you know, hearing and seeing different blurbs about the prophetic word that Dave Wilkerson gave. And of course that was, a, a, a message that was preached that was condensed into a couple of sentences. Right. A lot of people were like, That's not verified. That's not verified. it was verified. I heard the message, the whole thing. Uh, he preached it in 1986 and it's, it's on, uh, I'll find it and post it on here so people can see it. But I mean, it, it, he preached that message. It was just capsulized uh, in a couple of sentences, but you know, he kept saying in that message, and uh, over, and you knew him, right? Did you know him? Yeah. yeah. He, he was the gentleman that God used to call me to the ministry by a word of knowledge. And wow. he, uh, uh, it's an amazing story where I was, I, he did crusades in Orange County. I was one of the youth leaders at Melody Land working closely in the Jesus movement. Wow, wow. I had 10 drug addicts that were receiving the Lord. We were sitting like uh, Indian cross-legged and 10 of us are receiving the Lord. When all of a sudden David Wilkerson storms into the room. And I want you to know that he was a scary individual in a good way, but scary. One of my jobs was to pick him up at the LA airport. 
but I, I'm sitting there and he's all of a sudden storms up to me and he said, young man, stand up. Now here's the backstory. I was in Orange County, but the Lord had told me to move back to Berkeley and start the university outreach that would have that great outpouring of the spirit for 10 years. And David looked at me and he said, what are you still doing here? God told you to leave. And I said, well, I need more experience. He said, son, God has qualified you. You need to get on the streets right away because God is going to use you. Wow. And he said, you've got to do this full time now. You're ready. And I'm telling you, 24 hours later, everything I owned was in the back of my Volkswagen bus. And you know what's sad is when it fits, you know, everything you own. <laughs> and I was back on the streets of Berkeley, <laughs> in the, the uh, wonderful Southern California for tear gas mm. and, and revolutionaries. But yes, David was an amazing man of God, a man of prayer, a man of wow. true power. Wow. Yeah, somebody somebody just posted on here on the statements that are scrolling on Facebook. They said they said we sh we I, I pray we never go back to the way we were. Thank you. That is that is that I'm like yes, that's so true. I pray, dear Jesus, let us never go back to how we were. Let this change us, radically transform us forever, and shake us free. Yeah. You know, one, one comment I want to make is that if you're going to believe what David Wilkerson said, folks, if you're going to believe that what he stood and said in 1986 was the word of the Lord, then you got to read the rest of his writings because you're signing up for some scary self-evaluation. Number one is he was desperately opposed to the entertainment center type church. He, he did not have any use for him. I'm sweet compared to his writings on these issues. Ah. He didn't like carnal pastors. He didn't like flaky Christians. He didn't like Christian materialism. He was he was deaf on the idea of church incorporated. Mm. What he believed was that we gathered together in the name of the Lord with a passion and a heart after God. And I'm saying you no one watching us right now has the right to cherry pick the parts of David's message they enjoy. They got to see the context of it. And, and yesterday, Lance Walnow said something. He went on with uh, Larry Sparks and they, they did an interview together and he nailed what he believed was the judgment of God on this coronavirus situation. He said, we built our own houses, but we didn't build the house of God. Ooh. And he said, God sent a man. He was rough. He was a rough cop. He was an individual from New York. And if, if Tr Donald Trump offends you, it's because you never met anybody from New York. That's all. But let me tell you something. We weren't grateful for the intervention of God. We did not That's show true. the appropriate gratitude to God that Hillary didn't get in the White House and the nonsense. And you look at it now. You got Adam Schiff. Uh, the number one candidate for a personality bypass operation. This guy right now wants to start another investigation. The America's dying. We're divided. We're absolutely suffering. Our economy is down. And he's saying, wait, we need one more investigation. This is the time for the church to wake up and quit dividing in their brain the difference between the political and the spiritual. Because the spiritual warfare we're in now is for the souls of our children, the destiny of this nation. And God pushed the pause button to wake yeah. us up and say, you have got to stand for what is on my heart. Let me yeah. tell you, in that sermon, David preached. He talked about pedophiles. He talked about abortion. He talked about the devastation of children in America. And he's saying the vats of wrath have filled the heart of God. How do you think God feels when a pastor can't confront abortion from his pulpit? When he, can't do it, when, when he gives you a million excuses for, for why he isn't doing it. And then we look at what our nation is experiencing. You know, this, I had one guy said, you know what? I got a prophetic word from God that this virus is going to go away by a certain weekend. And I looked at him and I said, dude, you have just gargled with gunpowder and shot your mouth off. These <laughs> fakey prophecies 
are not what we need to be dug into. We need to get our Bible, open it up and say, God, I don't need a word from a man. I need the word of God to do work in me. And I thought, we're not going to rebuke this thing away. Mm -mm. We're going to repent it away. Yes. The Bible says you turn from your wicked ways, then I'll heal your land. And to repent, not just saying you're sorry. Repent is turning around. It's a full turnaround. People get this thing of, oh, well, he repented. No, he said they're sorry. They said they were, forgive me. That's all they said. But repentance means action. I'm sorry for interrupting. You're doing That's that's the Bill Clinton repentance. I'm sorry I got caught. See, it is not turning from your wicked ways and feel grief over what you did to God's heart. I love Um, you just say it. Yes, come on. And and so we look at it. And and you know, the Lord's really dealt with me to say, tell the people to individually repent. Quit talking about national repentance. Come on. Here's why I want you to quit talking about national repentance. There is none. There's none right now. You can't even name one mega pastor, not even one, who has stood up in his pulpit or or through social media has said, you know, the way I was doing it was wrong. The way that we were organized was wrong. My sermons were devoid of standing up for the unborn and for natural marriage. I did not do it. I was afraid. I was wrong. But I vow to you now that I have changed. That is not happening, Rob. Robbie, it's not happening. What's happening right now is they are sitting at home and they're tinkering with their empire and yearning for the day that we can fire up the engines again. And and believe me, if this virus ended today, the church would be back to its normal day-to-day stuff within days. There is nothing that tells us there's going to be that heart check that says, let's make church the presence of God. Let's make church teaching the word of God. Let's go out and win souls. Let's lay hands on the sick. Let's do the work of Christ. Let's do what Jesus did that is still not being said. And we have no reason to believe. And I I was in prayer this morning and my heart just said, God, don't extend this virus because the church has refused to repent. Speak to your holy prophetic core and tell them that like Daniel, they can stand between heaven and earth as priests and command God's love to be demonstrated and mercy. But it's done, what did Daniel do? He repented for his own sins. Then he repented for the sins of Israel. He went into great detail in Daniel chapter nine, describing everything Israel had done to break God's heart. You can do that. I can do that. Let's not, here, look, get along with God and don't say, Lord, help America to repent. Stop it. Say, I repent. I want to feel your grief. I want to feel your brokenness. There may not be anyone else available, but I'm available to repent before God, to admit I was wrong, and then to stand before you, Lord, and say, forgive our preachers for their compromise and forgive our nation for its sin. Forgive us for having murder incorporated to the unborn that would make Absolute the efficiency with which we are able to kill human beings in America would make Hitler blush. I know that it is the will of God for individuals to get alone with God in this downtime and yeah. return. And yet we've got people saying that the the president who has done more to block abortion, they're accusing him of being Hitler. They're accusing yeah. him because of Even his Christians are people. And it's it's tried. No, most of the biggest pushback I've got uh, in my statements about uh, Donald Trump as president and supporting him have come from the church, have come from Christian, you know, Christian believers. And then, you you know, you bring up you you bring up abortion and they're like, yeah, but what about immigration? What about like they bring up one thing as if one thing sort of, you know, justifies uh, the other and. And it, it, we are in a state, this nation is in a state of confusion 
like I've never seen. And you know what? I got tired. I, Maria, I will confess to you, I allowed public opinion get me to pipe down. It's easy for that to happen, brother. I got sick of it. I told my wife, I don't care if everybody clicks unlike. I don't care if all of you stop following. I don't give a rip anymore. Standing in Afghanistan with a gun pointed in my face got me to wake up and say, I don't care about public opinion. I don't exactly care right. Facebook. I'm going to stand before God. I want to hear what the father has to say. I don't but, care about this. Yeah. And you know, all of a sudden, everything starts coming in perspective when you're oh, yeah. in position. <laughs> you know, let me tell you something. Let's go back to Donald Trump for a second. And if there are Christians who hate him, please listen, turn up the volume on your uh, your device. Share I'm it. Out here. I'll hear this right all, now. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. yeah. Imagine if all the policies that he uh, advocated had been done. Number one, we had closed the border. Number two, we had stopped depending on China. Number three, we had forced manufacturing in our own nation of our own medication, our own uh, antiviral medication, our own surgical mask. If we had listened to Trump, we wouldn't be in this. And even until the last minute, ladies and gentlemen, they were calling him racist because he had shut down flights from China to here. And New York hypocritically the leftist leadership of New York City was still in the first week of March of this year, just less than a few weeks ago, was telling New Yorkers to go to restaurants, telling them that the virus was not a threat, telling them to have Chinese New Year, because if you don't, you're racist. In their zeal not to look racist, they opened us up to us. And accusing Donald Trump of racism is the most hollow, baseless. It doesn't hold water. It is absolutely, it goes over like a pregnant pole vaulter. It's like trying to sell hearing aids over the phone because putting America first would have stopped this virus. It would have stopped it dead in its tracks. So let's lay blame where it belongs. But here's what Lance is saying. And I believe that if David Wilkerson was here, would be saying the same thing. You did not understand the day of your visitation. Mm. You didn't know when God, and in one translation it says, you didn't know when God came to help you. And we have sneered at this wall, uh, tweeting bomb, bombastic thing, but we don't understand. It wasn't Donald Trump that's going to save America, but he opened the door for the church to wake up. And we have to say now, core of God's people, you prophetic core, you people that love God, you ones that didn't buy into the big screens, fog machines and skinny jeans. Let me tell you, you that haven't done that, that have wanted church to be two or three gathered in his name, you have the power now to get the microphone. You have the power now to turn this around. You have the power now because all that light and airy and compromised preaching looks absolutely silly right now. And it's an hour for our prayers to be heard, for us to get along with God and say, Lord, I confess my sin and even the sins of my nation as a priest before God. And I believe that you will hear and answer and heal our land with mighty revival. Jeez. Glory to God. Oh man. Whoo. You get me all fired up. I mean, you get me, Likewise, brother, <laughs> you get me fired up. This is so good. You know, because we, as a church, we've got to step out of this place of, of, of having this, you know, um, you know, sort of, again, this, and I, and like I shared on the the last program we did, the you know that we that we sacrifice biblical truth on the altar of cultural relevance. All right. of a sudden, the cultural relevance has become so much more the priority rather than speaking the truth of what the Scripture says. Yeah. And the thing of it is, what I noticed is this, Mario, and and is that whenever we're in the throes of something like this, whenever we try to change the plan. Well, or, or And with that, I mean change the message of what God is speaking. Whenever we tried to revamp it or something, we mess it up. Mess it up. 
and, and uh, when and you you see through scripture you know how that uh, that even happens over and over i mean if if david would have put on the armor which was the intelligent thing to do rather than what was god prompting him that god wanted david to go as david and slay goliath and not be suited up in somebody else's identity somebody else's covering but in the one that god had made him and yeah. what happens is, is we as the church have put on a different identity in order to think we relate. And the Lord has called us to that. And that's what, you know, the Bible says about Saul, he was head and shoulders taller than every other man in Israel. And I always say that's head and shoulders leadership versus Holy Spirit leadership. You know, when you went overseas and you went into Muslim countries, I'm going to predict something. When you started to preach in Afghanistan, and the other nations you were in, Robbie, it was the beauty and the power and the glory and the surpassing superiority of Christianity to every other message was glaring at that point. Mm -hmm. and, and you were superconducting. You know, a lot of people don't know what superconducting is. They know that at a certain low temperature, all the drag on an electric current goes away. Electricity would be a thousand times stronger if it was superconducted. Wow. What happens when you leave America where we are culturally compromised and we've created every kind of Christian mutation possible and we have foisted on the American public an un, a, a message between the message, which is Christianity on its own is not interesting. It's not powerful. It doesn't justify your total commitment. So we're going to add perks. So people aren't genuinely converted. They don't feel the lightning strike of grief over their sin, like the amazing grace. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and mm -hmm. my fear relieved. We, we don't preach that grace teaches you to fear God. We only teach that grace gives God a kind of a quasi coma where no matter what you do he's so into you he won't he'll even violate his own holy character to keep your interest mm. the fact is when you were in afghanistan you were super conducting because the the clarity there was no religious spirit present no, no. just devil and god and you could see, and I know the frustration that was in your heart because the anointing flows so strong. See, when I get in a tent and I preach because I have the authority to generate the atmosphere, I bring in the homeless, I bring in the drug addict, I bring in the paralyzed, they get up out of wheelchairs, they get delivered from alcohol in one step instead of 12 because there's no religious drag. There's yeah. no spirit out there that grew up in this stuff and learned how to be immune to it. Mm. That is what we got to realize. The reason I don't preach a compromised gospel is because I know the active ingredient. I understand that what's going to happen to you, and this is where we get bogged down on the four part instead of the active part. And what I mean by that simply is this, wait till you feel the joy, wait till you feel the peace, wait till you feel the sense that you are a child of God, on. no longer bound to anything. No wonder I preach hard, because I know what you're going to be like if you accept it the way I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. And that's why we can't cheapen it. You, so here we get, if I try to soften the blow of repentance, I'm also going to dilute the power of the joy and the peace that comes afterwards. Yeah. And that's why we're at a moment now where Americans are ready. The lost are ready. This is why I feel for the hypocrite. You're the you're the ground zero for the stampede mentioned in Matthew eleven twelve. The kingdom suffers violent, and the violent take it by force. When the godly core reach up to God and say, "Let me know you intimately, powerfully. I want to know you, Lord." The, according to Daniel eleven thirty two, the people that know their God will be strong and carry out great acts. What happens when the on-fire Christian meets the totally broken, sorrowful, lost soul? They're going to rush toward each other in a violent revelation of God. And you know who's going to get trampled? The hypocrite is standing there going, what's going on? What's up with this? And I know that that hour is upon us right now. I know that coming out of this, 
that so, our upon us. You know, I just watched uh, t t tonight, my wife and I, before we did this, I was just watching that TV series, The Chosen. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but it's this uh, its this depiction of Jesus and you watch on Facebook and it's a, it's a great show. I encourage a lot of people to see it. I mean, there's a lot of creative, you know, liberty in it, uh, you know, but they had to do that to build the story and to make it and stuff like that. But I was watching tonight the, the woman at the well piece and uh, that that aired actually, I think for the first time last night, but we didn't have time and we were catching up on it. And one of the things that gripped me, and I preached this about this passage before, but Jesus wasn't even focused on the woman's sin when he looks at her and said, go get your husband. And she goes, well, I don't have a husband. And he goes, well, actually, you know, you've had five and the one you're with now is not your husband. It was interesting to me because I, a few years ago, for the first time I read that passage and I realized he never mentioned sin in the word sin, but what he was hitting in, and this is what where sin is, is sin is always connected to a wound. Right. There's a wound in an individual, and Jesus was revealing because the, the acting out in sin was a result of the wound. And she was wounded in relationships. She was wounded in this place. And, you know, and back in those days, I mean, a woman who had had sex before marriage, which life right. took them out of a rape. It could have, I mean, there was no recourse. If you were a guy, you pretty much, I mean, they threw the woman caught in adultery at Jesus' feet. They certainly didn't throw the man too. That's so right. I mean, it was always this sort of exposing this thing. But he, the, the compassion of speaking to her of, I've got water that you don't know of, and I've got water what he was calling her to was a new life. He was calling yeah. her to repentance because he was speaking spirit and truth. Those who worship me, it's not going to be at this place or that place, but it's going to be a spirit of truth. And that can only come through relationship, but yeah. it was a call to repentance. Yeah. And the only way that we can do that. I mean, we in the church, there's a mass part of the church, even a, a movement I've been a part of that are taking hell out of the equation. Yeah. Not taking what, that how how do you go there and and oh but no ours is more loving mario we've got a better gospel because we don't talk about the consequences of sin and we don't talk about the the hell people are living in the consequences of sin and their brokenness i mean how did we get there where we're just throwing out this you know the tr you and i grew up with knowing this truth but how did we get to that place where we're throwing this out and what motivates us to go rescue people from it if we don't, if, if we're saying, yeah, it's not there anymore? You know, the spirit that is so strong in this hour is the spirit of men wanting to control. That's the key. We want to control. We want, we want people we want to control. In, uh, there's a codependency. If a preacher begins to do an 18 series uh, episodes, of how to get over your past. There's an underlying key there. I don't want you to ever fully get delivered. I want an open-ended therapy where you and I, you need my emotional support. And that's why they don't win souls. That's why they never leave the four walls of the church because they've been innately conditioned to believe that they're not qualified yet, not ready yet, can't do it yet. And witnessing is the most automatic thing. It's something you can do five minutes after you're saved. Come on. And that's only if you waste four minutes. Come on. But I really, truly believe this. The woman at the well reveals something, Robbie, that is so explosive. Because look at what Jesus did. He said, if you knew the gift and who it was that asked you, you would ask and receive living water. He said that if she understood his message, she would repent. And there are millions like that all over the world. The only reason that's still there in misery is no one has offered them living water. Here's what Jesus said. I predict that if you knew what I was really trying to tell you right. and you knew the properties and the impact of this water and what it will do in you, how it will alter your life, you would ask and receive. You know, I was with Lance Wallnow in Washington, D.C., and we were doing a, a lecture. Uh, we were He was doing a lunch, and we were sitting up on stools. Everybody's eating lunch in the Abraham Lincoln room of the Trump 
international hotel, but you could see the streets. I was right up against a window. You could see the streets of Washington, D.C. And I said something to Lance, and he stared at me like had a, he had a wow moment, which I give God the glory for. He's, I said to him, Lance, get me a worship team that can really play and sing well and put me on that street corner right now. And I promise you in five minutes, there'll be people on their knees getting saved. Come on. That's the hunger that's everywhere. That's why we have no excuse for not preaching the word of God. And this is the moment where I believe America is being shaken to find out I don't know what love is. I don't know what truth is. I don't believe my professor anymore. I'm not buying into this garbage that there are 57 genders. I'm not believing any of this anymore. We had, that was a bubble. That was, that was the result of a medication kicking in at the same moment that a clown was talking in your ear. <laughs> now, reality, reality. I need God. Yes. I need God. And, and soul winning is going to make a return because it's going to be forced on us by a desperate generation, forced on us. So yeah. tell me, I don't want to hear that stuff. Tell me about Jesus. I don't want to hear this debate. I don't want to hear about whether you believe in, in full immersion baptism or spot removing. I don't care. <laughs> what I want to know is give me Jesus. Come right? on. You know, I, I had a, a friend of mine who's a youth pastor in Miami. His name is Josue uh, David, and he was uh, he was just talking to me uh, yesterday. He passed, uh, the youth pastor at uh, Jesus is King uh, Church down in Miami, and he told me yesterday. He said, "Robbie, he goes, I've made this." He goes, you, he goes, you remember the, the drenching videos uh, where people were, you know, for the Lou Gehrig's disease, you know, taking the bucket of ice and water. He says, I want to I want to do a challenge for the whole body of Christ to make just a a quick, you know, five minute video where they talk about, uh, you know, the, the power of G he goes, they could even do it in a minute. But talk yeah. about how they're, you know, all of us have the same testimony. If people are like, I don't have a good testimony. I don't have a Mario Marilla testimony or, or I, haven't, I haven't been. You know, Mario, when I was a kid, you know, uh, we had all these drug addicts because we were in an inner city that were coming to our church. And they had the most amazing story. I, I, I was a missionary kid. I'm born on the mission yeah. field, grown up in church all my life. I, I didn't have a cool testimony. So I made up a testimony that I was smoking weed and I was addicted to weed. <laughs> Mario, I was lying. I just wanted to have a cool testimony to tell. You know, Mama, with all the love, she stopped me and she looked at me and she goes, Robbie, all of our testimonies are the same. It yeah. was the same testimony of the blind man. Once I was blind, but now I see. And she said, just stick to that. And, and it's powerful because it's your story. Whatever you've been through, it's powerful because it's your story. And people will be impacted. And I want to challenge everybody. Do what my friend Jose, Josue was talking about. And, be great. and pull up that, uh, pull up that, put that up on yours and send it as a private message to people. And tell them to, you know, to FaceTime you or to get on. Listen, let's, let's wear this. Rather than all these people, th th these porn sites are getting blown up. Because people can't go to their strip clubs and can't go. And this is, people are going to say, I'm a hellfire preacher by saying this. That's not what the case is. I'm saying right now, people are going there because they are, and they have no relationship. They have no, so they're looking for the virtual. And yeah. so right, people use this medium right now to take and to share your story and the power of the transforming power of what Jesus Christ did to you and and go to your grocery we all go to the essential how did the church Mario how did the church become non-essential in an in an ep, in a pandemic how did the church get written off as being Non essential. I'm sorry, but I I I'm, I thank God for Rodney Howard with his persistence in yeah. conducting his church. I don't care what everybody say what you want about the irresponsibility. The Church of Jesus Christ is essential. It is the we are the ambassadors of God on this earth. Ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Get essential in your yeah, come on, Robbie. Preach it, brother. 
<laughs> Sorry. This is man, a no, no. Man. What you're saying is so needed right now. And I know that we're voicing the frustration of, of tens of thousands of born again Christians in America. And how do we become un any essential or unessential? Because the, the preachers, the modern preacher made us unimportant by making us harmless, by dumbing us down, by sitting us there Sunday after Sunday, preaching this impotent entitlement mm. that absolutely destroyed it. You know, how could we have imagined the, our government not shutting down the church after we gave them every excuse to believe we were not important, we were not essential? This isn't a message you need to accept. This isn't a life you need to live. Preach we're not going to put any demands on you. We literally got a black belt on leaving demands of people off. Years and years ago, Dr. David McKenna, who was the president of Gordon Conwell uh, Theological Seminary, he was also the president of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. He wrote a book called Fire in the Fireplace, mm -hmm. which was amazing. It's talking about how fire belongs in the church. It shouldn't yeah. be outside the church. It should be in the church. And one of the things he said, and it was so prophetic, he said, a congregation will promote a man to superstar status if in exchange he will keep the demands of God off of their life. And that's precisely what's happened. The I'm paying you, pastor, to leave me alone, leave my adultery alone, leave my mistress alone, leave my double standards alone, leave my life alone. And what did the pastor become? He became a, a, a non entity and that you cannot tell people they are wrong. You can tell them they made a mistake. You can tell them there's a better way to have a vacation. You can tell them about things, but you cannot tell them they are wrong. David Wilkerson stood in Times Square Church and said to the body, you are wrong. Yeah. And they loved him for it. And they loved Finney for it. And you know who else they love? Billy Graham. Come Billy on. Graham. Let me tell you, Billy Graham had a meeting in 1964 in the Los Angeles Coliseum. He didn't use any tricks. He didn't deceive the audience. There were no door prizes. There was no uh, mingling of new age terminology with Christianity. On Inside the Coliseum were 134,000 people from Los Angeles. On the scoreboard, it said from John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And let me tell you, 30,000 never got in the building. The freeways were packed in all directions. And what were they there for? They were not drawn by a deluded, a compromising, apologetic, unscriptural, leaving hell out, leaving the blood out, leaving the cross out. He talked about hell. He talked about the cross. He talked about the coming of Christ. He talked about how the world was falling apart because God had been rejected in the schools and in government. And the masses came and they'll come again. Believe me, they'll come again. I want to challenge yeah. every pastor that's listening to me to start becoming armed and dangerous for Christ. Don't fear your board. Don't let your church be deacon possessed. Don't be an individual who relies on the checkbook or the tithe, but relies on the Holy Spirit to grow the church. Preach what God gives you to preach. Remember, there is, there is liberation in truth in the name of Jesus. And that's all I got to say, brother. I'll tell you. Uh, that is not all you have to say. That is not true. You have so much to say. It's so good. <laughs> yes, I, bless you. Yes. I, love, I love it. You know, Mario, I, I think that one of the things that 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 the Lord is is dealing with us on is that we've, you know, we, people people really we we've 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 chosen what's comfortable. Yes. God has chosen what's uncomfortable. 
Yeah. And I, I was in a church uh, before uh, moving here uh, that uh, where we where we live now. And uh, there was the pastor it came to me and he goes, you you use or one of the one of the pastors, uh, part of the past preaching team said, you use too many verses when you preach. You're preaching for you're using too many verses. And I was like, I never dreamed in my life. You'd ever hear something like that. I never dreamed in my life. Somebody would say to me, you, you use too many verses. And I said, well, how many do you propose? They said, well, our rule is you only use two. And I was like two verses for like a whole 30, 35 minute message, only two verses. And they were like, yeah, that's it. And they, they said, now if it's a conference, it's different. If it's a, and I was, I was in shock. And then the same, the same, you know, uh, I got up and I made a comment about, uh, about how that, uh, when, uh, Bruce Jenner came out as Caitlyn Jenner and how that this was not courage because they were giving him a courage award, right. it, they're giving him a courage award in front of men who lost limbs in wars to preserve this nation, they were giving a guy who's in stilettos, an evening gown, and and lip gloss. Hey, and brother, board, and they're and bypassing these guys who had had severed limbs, legs gone, to a pin it on this guy. And I said, that is not uh, that is not uh, courage. It's a spirit of confusion. This is this guy should have been given the confusion award because it's a confusion. Now, thank God, I really believe I have a friend I believe who's speaking into this person's life now, and some things are happening in them. But man, they had a we we had, we had a pastors meeting where pastors were furious at me, and they said we never talk about that subject. We never approach that subject. Oh. And I looked at him and I said, I said, you know what? I, I looked at the senior pastor. I said, you should want to like kiss me right on the cheek because I did a favor. I then said it when you didn't have the courage to say it. And you know what, Mario, the thing that really that hit me in that moment was I thought, how far have we been lulled to sleep? How far that you remember we talked about last week that the Iranians said that there's a, a satanic lullaby that the church has been lulled to sleep in this satanic lullaby to the point to where that all of that just gets a pass. And you know what? Two people walked out of the church of about 2,500 or 3,000, and they were furious at me because two people walked out of the church. I said, listen, let me preach next week, and I'll make sure a lot more walk out. Let's try to empty this place out. Let me preach next week, and I'll make sure there's more <laughs> to it than that. And yeah. we prayed for this, man. But we have slipped into this place. And again, it's what I believe the Lord spoke to me and what I shared last week about the Iranian church is that all of a sudden the Lord is getting rid of his handlers. He's getting rid of the handlers of his house, not shepherds, because these are not shepherds. Shepherds don't do that. These are handlers of the church. And God is is getting rid of the handlers and and people, I, I, you know, we're, people don't know the hits that guys, you don't know the hits Mario takes for saying the stuff that he takes. You don't understand the backlash this man gets in 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 writing, uh, you know, the abortion clinics are open while the churches are closed. These articles, these his blogs that he's put out there that that we need to leave Sesame Street and get back to Azusa Street. I mean, the hits. When you speak the truth, you know, you, you better have thick skin because people come after you and they're going to come. And the, but the problem is, is we as the church, we've gotten so thin skinned and right. we've gotten to this place to where that we, we, we can't handle it anymore. And so the compromise has been the result. Dear God, help us, you know, and, and the only way we get out of that is by stepping out of it. You know, and think about this. Would we give a courage award to an anorexic for starving themselves? Would we do that? Would we would yeah. we give a courage no. award to a suicidal no because they went ahead and jumped off the building? No. See, giving in to an unnatural desire, giving in to a destructive desire, mm. and, and celebrating that, we do it for some things. We won't do it for others because we worship sex in this country. Come and on. We worship sexual identity. That's why we have a double standard. We have wow. a standard that we can say, well, this person having 
uh, sexual identity dysphoria. Uh, we need to help them give in to their urge. Whereas the anorexic, we would never do that. We would never tell them to go ahead and starve themselves. And that's why that wasn't courage. That mm -hmm. was someone succumbing to an inward urge that was both destructive and unnatural. And yeah, you and I, we're going to get, we're going to get a firestorm for this, but you know what we have yeah. protecting us? We're in the coronavirus bomb shelter <laughs> where suddenly people aren't as boastful, arrogant, and right. not spouting this stuff. That stuff, that, that stuff that allows unnatural things to be celebrated was the stuff of affluence. It was the stuff of false safety, and it doesn't work during a pandemic. Mm. And it sounds stupid. Righteousness, truth, turning to God, that's the issue in this hour right now. That's the message of this hour, that what you're doing is destroying you. What you're doing is hurting you. Yes. I, we had one uh, presidential candidate say, if you have a struggle with my sexual orientation, that your problem is with God. And I thought to myself, my problem is not with God. Mm -mm. Because God, the word of God said in James, he said, if you are tempted, do not say you are tempted of God. For Ooh, God come on. Not be tempted by evil, neither does he tempt with evil. What, what we've got to understand, and you and I talked about this last time, we all have things in us that we don't give into. We, get, we don't give in to anger. We don't give in to suicide. We don't give in to depression. We don't give in to fear. And to suddenly say, oh, well, here are the things you do give in to. And do it outside the Bible. You're going to open the door for society to destroy itself. And that's where we were headed before this pandemic. We were going to self-destruct as a nation. But God in his mercy is trying to speak to us mm. and help us and to transform us. Oh, that's so good. You know, I mean, I just keep thinking of of how that in this time, you know, I, I remember when uh, there was uh, on a blog of these uh, preachers that, that they were criticizing and speaking against Lance for on about the seven mountains uh, thing and yeah. they, because he made the comment that it's time to storm the cockpit. And yeah. they were like, how dare he, this is not how, that is not, you know, what Christ would do. But people don't understand Jesus, Jesus at the cross stormed the cockpit. That's what he did. He took the keys. He, he is, can you imagine the look on Satan's face watching him descend to hell? Can you imagine the look and him thinking, Boys, I don't know what we did, but we got him. Something we did hooked him. Somehow we tempted him because he's coming to hell. He's ours. And then all of a sudden, can you imagine the devil extending his hand saying, welcome. And then Jesus going, I didn't come for your hand. I came for those keys. Give me those keys. That was Jesus single-handed <laughs> storming the cockpit. Come on, brother. Come on. <laughs> that where we're at right now. We got to storm the cockpit. This isn't about us hijacking a government. Oh. This is about a system of man. I mean, I think, I, dear God, I know Mario Mario and I would never lessen ourselves to seek the seat no. of the president because no. we don't want to take a lower position. We no. are men of God. We are in the greatest kingdom that has ever lived that will never end. It is the unstoppable force on the planet. Why would we give that up to take a lesser position by no. being the president of the most powerful nation on earth? Is that we are about the kingdom. We're about Jesus's work. But this is the time we as believers storm the cockpit in the sense that we go after those who are lost, those who are dying. People are, everybody's saying it's okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to eventually, yeah, sure, because revival's going to hit. And we're going to see what David Wilkerson's message was not about the collapse of Wall Street or the United States. The message was, this is the sign that the third great awakening has hit the United States of America and the world. This is a sign of that. Everybody's getting distracted with the message of what's going to happen in calamity and the pandemic, and they're missing awakening, awakening. 
awakening, you know? Sorry. You see, Mario gets me this way. <laughs> Man. Well, you got to realize that it's possible. It's, it's true possible. spiritual father of mine, right? You're looking. You, you know what? I I got to tell you, man, you're thrilling me to death. You, But did you know that uh, the it's quite possible that the Zeusa Street outpouring literally began within hours of the San Francisco earthquake? They were virtually simultaneous. Wow. In fact, one of the first missionary trips that William Seymour organized is people from the Azusa Street Mission got on on uh, on the ve whatever vehicles they had at that day in 1906 and went up to San Francisco to preach and help feed the people in that disaster. I it's it's not unusual for calamity and revival to be connected to each other. Historically, it's happened a lot. And it, I, I believe you're right. I believe we're on the brink of something. It's and David said it. I want to give honor where honors due. David Wilkerson said it. You know what? I just wanted to encourage everybody, step up, don't step away, be courageous right. and, 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 and really engage in this. And please do me a favor, everybody right now, if you're from if you're from my Facebook page, go to Mario Marillo's Facebook page, click like, follow him, go to Mario Marillo Ministries. Please, you know, all of us, none of us are having meetings right now, which is the main way that we support our ministries. Will you please bless this man and bless his ministry? We need it for our, for our ministry, but let me say this. I would so much rather have you pour towards him and pour into what this meant because the impact it's had on my life, right. I know God will take care of us, but would you guys please sow a seed into Mario Murillo ministries because this ministry is crucial and myself, my, uh, many of my friends honor and respect him. And, and, you know, uh, I and Tom Crandall talk about Mario all the time. <laughs> when we're together, and we get all excited. And listen, please, so into bless this ministry. He's not coming on here for this. He's coming on here because he loves Jesus and he loves the church and he loves the world and wants to see him come to Jesus. But Mario, would you take a, a minute just in closing and would you just pray for us? P pray, would you please pray that phrase that we would be the fireplace Every house watching now would be the fireplace in the neighborhood. When you said that, man, my heart leapt. Would you please, and whatever else the Holy Spirit gives you, whatever the Lord says to you, would you just take that and do that now? Lord, help us to do what Paul did when the door slammed behind him and he realized he was trapped in a jail cell. Surely God has a plan for me now in this jail cell. And surely God has a plan for you, sir, and you, my sister, in your home, in this hour, when we are when we are shut in, let us be shut in with God. That old song, let it be real to us that new things are being born, that fire will flow, that we will use whatever vehicle we can on social media right now to be the light of God in a dark moment, to be the prayer of healing, to be the message of forgiveness to be the fragrance of Christ to a generation that is so yearning for hope right now with so much despair, so much fear, so many vile and disastrous images being in our mind. Let, oh God, your word and your spirit rise on every one of us until we understand that we are not on this earth to even feel safe. We're not on this earth to feel good. We're on this earth to be a weapon in the hand of God and to derive our joy and to derive our excitement from being used of God in an impossible situation. And we look to you, Lord, the way Jehoshaphat looked. We have no might against this host, O Lord, but our eyes are on you. And then the prophet spoke and said, you will not fear. You will not need to fight in this battle for the battle is the Lord's and not yours. And we thank you, Lord, that it is all 
completely in your hands. And we rest in that. And we thank you for the third wave of supernatural awakening in America. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, Jesus, and forgive us for being the church that is firefighters. Forgive us for being firefighters where we're putting fires out and rather than starting fires. And that comes right out of from Mario's book, uh, Fresh Fire. Lord, forgive us for that. No longer being firefighters, but flamethrowers of your spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, shut that up. And Mario, I bless you. I honor you, Papa Mario. I I just feel so deep in my heart, just so much love and so much. Same thing, my friend. You're, you're a great man of God, and I'm honored to work with you. I'm just dying to get on a plane and, and just come and see you, just to be around you. I just want to, I don't know, take your clothes and wash them or something. I just want to be, I just want to be in proximity to you. That's all. Well, you promised me I could go to the Middle East with you, so I, we'll work on that. Yeah, I'm come trying on. to find something just as dangerous. Uh, to California that will compete with Afghanistan. Believe me. <laughs> I've been there. I know. There's there's a lot there. That's yes, sir. Yeah, right. God, sure love you, man. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you guys for joining us, and and we'll definitely do this again. We'll try to put this on uh, as much as Mario will do it. I'll I'll be happy to host it. And uh, okay. we'll have revival. Let's just yeah, have come on. God bless you guys. Go be the church and to be in that, be in the hope of the world. And don't forget Jesus first, safety last. We don't put our safety before we put Jesus. We put Jesus before our safety because that's the safest place to be. Anybody who told you the safest place to be is in the center of God's will, first of all, they're lying to you because it's one of the most dangerous places to be. But you were made to be there, and that is where we're supposed to be. And that in that peace, we find safety. God bless you guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mario, so much for being here. Brother, God All bless. Right. All right, guys. Till next time. God bless.